I want to talk, um, this, this talk's going to be a little bit about what happens when you reduce the quantum dimensionality that an electron, that is available to an electron in the solid state. Well, what do I mean by this? I mean that if, if you have a, an electron in a crystal, in a piece of metal, then that um, electron has three dimensional degrees of freedom. Those three dimensional degrees of freedom are a little bit conditioned by the crystal structure because an electron moving through crystals in different directions will experience a different atomic grid that it moves through, a different, different spacing in different directions, so called k space. But what I want to talk about is really the fundamentals of taking something from three dimensions down to two dimensions, down to one dimension, down to zero dimensions. So going from a three dimensional system through a two dimensional electron gas down to something like a quantum point contact down to a quantum dot so-called quantum dot. Now, um, I want to describe this stuff from the point of view of a quantum mechanic in the initial stages of designing these devices, because, um, well, I am that quantum mechanic. Uh, I was taken on to work at Philips as, a, as an elementary particle physicist, and uh, um, my first design of experiment was to look for, in a two-dimensional electron gas where uh, very, you have very long mean free paths of electrons. Electrons flow quantum mechanically as, as deterministic um, entities. They can move over many tens, hundreds, even across a whole device in two dimensional electron gas without scattering. And it was this kind of technology that led to the quantum Hall effect and Klaus von Klitzing's 1980 Nobel Prize on that. So I wanted to, as a quantum mechanic, I knew about these states and I wanted to look at spectroscopy of these states. So I designed a device which was intended to inject things into two-dimensional electron gas and study the, the quantum Hall uh, systems in, in those two-dimensional electron gases. And to do that, um, the team, the Philips team, um, came together and ideas were put together from various sources. Um, Dirk van der Marrel started this looking, thinking about looking at, uh, at uh, point contacts, then he left the group. Um, and um, I wanted to come in and do spectroscopy on these things, so I wanted to sign a spectrometer. Henk van Houten pointed out that the Cambridge group had been looking at split gate devices, which were more controllable in terms of how, how big a, um, uh, in terms of controlling the size of the injector and the size of the um, and the size of the uh, probe. So we decided to copy um, what they had been doing in that sense, and uh, we at Philips couldn't make these devices, so we roped in Delft University of Technology um, to uh, help us make them. And uh, so, and, and, and a group was born in this sense that was a collaboration between Philips and Delft to look at these kinds of devices. So I designed the, um, the what, what was the world's first quantum point contact device, um, electrostatically designed the shape of the gates, decided how far apart they should do, looked at the electrostatics to decide how, how big they needed to be and, also how small we could make them, which in those days wasn't nano, but it was really micro technology that we were looking at. And uh, we built the device, had the device built, um, and um, it became a pretty famous device. It's the world's first quantum point contact device. So if you want to look us up, it's my most cited paper. Uh, if you look me up on Google Scholar or, or look up, um, look up um, Bart van Vey set up, um, Fizzrev letters um, uh, paper uh, that this was the quantum point contact device. So the, the famous part of it wasn't the spectrometry part, although that's also uh, there are a bunch of papers there with lots and lots of citations too. It was just looking at one of these, either the injector or the collector individually. So, so what do I mean by this quantization and what are these steps of quantization from three to two to one to zero? Um, well, uh, and for the moment, I'm talking about advice that goes from three to two to one dimensions. Let me, let me tell you what happens in these systems. As you take a three-dimensional electron gas, which is just electrons moving within a solid like a metal, conduction there is carried by conduction electrons. Those electrons can move in 3D. Now, in a two-dimensional electron gas, what you do is you torture the electrons to sit in an interface, flat interface, that is so well defined that the electrons form in one, the one dimension of their movement is constricted quantum mechanically. You end up with a sheet of electrons where the number of electron states vertically between the, it is just one. So it's a one electron thick, a one quantum mechanical electron thick layer that one has created. And we were lucky to have Tom Fox and, and Jeff Harris 
who were simply the best people at making this kind of material in the world at the time in the group working at Philips in the United Kingdom. And I think actually we had some design of those materials as well and they got up to, I had fun at one stage talking to them about that aspect of the design as well. I remember sitting in a pub once with a hundred beer mats using the beer mats to describe how quantum mechanical crystal growth happened. It was great fun. And I don't know whether they had any benefit or not, but the fact of the matter was they could make better materials than anyone else at that time anywhere in the world. So we had that as a base material. And then on top of that, we wanted to quantize the stuff in another direction to do quantum mechanics in another direction. So we already had a sheet of electrons, which were two dimensional. And what that does for you is it reduces the scattering of electrons. An electron that comes in in 3D, it can hit something and it can bounce off in any direction. But in 2D, it can't. It's not allowed to bounce vertically out of the sheet. It can only have scattering events in the plane. And that vastly reduces the amount of scattering. So why is this important? Well, it's if you've got a mobile phone, uh, this is the way that in the beginning to get up to much higher frequencies, much higher speeds, much higher purities, front end of mobile phones to begin with was based on this kind of technology. So that's where the mobile phone stuff comes from. Remember, there were no mobile phones before, before this. That's a, a later development in the 80s. So that's what it's useful for. It, 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 it um, reduces the, the possibilities that an electron has for scattering. Now, based on the talk I gave um, on Sunday, uh, Garnet Ord got back in touch and said, might this be related to the quantum Zeno effect? And uh, the quantum Zeno effect is this idea that that measurement alters the state of an electron. If you keep measuring it, it can't change state. Well, you know, uh, the, the Zeno effect's always been mystical. The original Zeno effect was was um, that um, the, the, the idea that um, things can, arrows can never hit targets, for example, because after they've gone halfway to get to the target, they need to go another halfway, and they need to go another halfway, and therefore they never meet the target, which of course is bullshit. Now, of course they hit the target, just stand there and let somebody shoot an arrow at you if you think that that's not gonna happen. But uh, the quantum Zeno effect is also a sort of mystical kind of thing now, and people think, but it's, it's really nothing to do with with the fact that you're making a measurement to so do that you're, you're attaching to a bigger quantum state. And here in this two dimensional electron gas, we're making sure that the, the quantum state is one which is just two dimensional. That's why it gets so much better and, uh, and, and maintains its state for longer. It doesn't change state so easily. But you know, you can do that trick once, but then you can do it again. You can go from a two deg to a one deg, one dimensional electron gas. And that's what the quantum point contact did. And it made quite a big stir, not as big as the fractional quantum wall effect or some other things, but nonetheless became one of the top 10 cited papers for a while uh, when it first came out. And what that was doing was it was taking that two dimensional electron gas and it was squeezing it quantum mechanically in another dimension to make a one dimensional, one dimension, what do I mean by one dimensional? I mean that quantum mechanically, you could get down to something which was one quantum state thick and one quantum state across. So you're putting your um, electrons through a pipe, which was effectively one dimensional, one electron at a time, clunk, clunk, one, 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 coming through in the currents you're putting there. And what we observed, and this was not something that I was expecting or any of the group was expecting, but it was spectacular and we knew what it was when we, when we saw it, was we saw quantized conductance steps. So the, set, the steps are quantized in terms of 2e squared, in terms of conductance is quantized in terms of 2e squared over h, you can get it down to e squared over h two spin states always coming through. Um, but it was two A squared over H steps that we saw. And um, this is a, as a consequence of going down to one dimension. Now, one dimensional electron pipes would be very interesting things. And that, I think now in 2020, we're beginning to get to the stage that the technology is at least close to being able to produce these things smoothly. And the interesting smooth properties that they'd have is that they would be very nearly, if not absolutely, perfect conductors. And what I mean by perfect conductors, I mean something which doesn't have any scattering at all. Once you get an electron into it, it, it doesn't have any means of getting out because it can only go along the pipe. It can't scatter out because there is no out. So the electrons kind of go through blah, 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 close to one another, sort of Wigner crystal like through, the, through these things. I don't think we've quite got that technology, but it's a very interesting technology and uh, which will happen at some point in the not too far distant future, I hope. 
But uh, that's what happens when you get down to one dimensional systems, you have no scattering. But okay, fast forward a few years from the quantum point contact, and I had an idea to go to zero dimensional states using similar technology. It was a bit more complicated. I had to argue a lot to get these things made. People thought, oh, this will never work. Anyway, so, but it didn't matter. I went ahead and designed the things anyway and uh, spent some time having a look at the shapes you'd need to make the gates. So if you look at the shapes on the first quantum dots, you'll find my name on the early papers, not on the later papers, uh, because this uh, research went on a long time after I left the Phillips group um, and uh, started working on the electron photon model, which we've been talking about. Um, but um, anyway, the initial design of this, the quantum mechanic who designed it was me, was, 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 was a, a, a six gate device which had an entry quantum point contact and an exit quantum point contact and a means to change the size of the depression that one formed inside. And the idea was to get down to an electron which was completely confined, which you could just have one electron on the top state, a single electron device, is how we described it in those days, not a quantum dot. So, um, so and we did that, so we achieved that thing. Leo, the excellent Professor Leon Cowenhoven, I think might have still been a student at that stage, brilliant guy, um, now, a, now a, a learned professor at Delft University, was the, pretty much the lead researcher on this for, a, for a quite a long period of time. So if you want to look up what happened from that, look up Cowenhoven et al. Uh, papers, and I went over many years. I think Leo actually, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Leo, I mean, if you, if you hear this, get in touch, obviously, but I think that it was one of the very first devices, I think you gave it a name, and you told me what the name was eventually because you did so many experiments on that particular one device that actually worked because it was pretty close to the edge of what was technologically possible. I think uh, I remember having a conversation, perhaps it's apocryphal, that you used that one device over many years and you gave it a name. And I forget what it was. Was it Martha or Mabel or something? Anyway, let me know. Anyway, you had a name. Lots of experiments were done on this single electron device in the beginning. Uh, papers like Next Electron, please. You could use a single electron pump. So you, you pump one electron in, you hold it, and then by modulating the input and output, you could let one come in, quantum mechanically confine it, and then let one out. So you could have a stream of electrons coming out that was frequency locked. You could have a current with no noise on it. So pretty cool devices and still, even, even what is it, 35 years ago, um, I think they're pretty, they're still cutting edge technology to do such things nowadays. You know, that's what a zero dimensional, that's what a quantum dot is. It's something where you you get so confined that really effectively there's just one quantum mechanical device. And um, yeah, that's what a quantum dot is. So, um, so th these days there's lots of stuff talked about quantum dots in terms of technology, for example, for so use sorts of solar cells or not. Uh, but but that's, that's how the things first came into being. Anyway, so there. Uh, and that's the end of what I want to say about these things for the time being. So 